Welcome, SciCommerce. For today's mentor chat, we're exploring visual science communication. We're lucky to have Scientific American Senior Graphics Editor, Jen Christensen. Uh, Jen, could you please introduce yourself to our community? Hi, sure. Thanks so much for having me. Um, uh, yes, I'm Jen. Um, I'm a graphics editor at Scientific American. Uh, previously, I was at National Geographic and I freelanced for some time as well. Um, yeah, and I do have kind of, I know this is an informal group, but sometimes with the visuals, um, uh, it's useful to have a presentation plan. So, cause I have images like at the ready then that I can speak to. So, um, so if you all are game, I have about a half hour talk and then we can have a conversation after that, um, I was hoping. And so um, if you'll forgive me for a moment while I set up PowerPoint, um, I'm gonna set this up. Uh, let's see, start by sharing my screen. Um, and I won't be able to see the chat or probably you very well while I'm presenting, but I'm hoping afterwards we can go over it again. Um, I, I can take a look at the chat and we can we can talk then. So let's see. Are you seeing a visual communication title slide now? Yep, looks yes. good. Mm, yep. Great, cool. So let me just move this over. Okay. Um, so uh, yes, I'm here to talk about science communication using visuals. Um, my particular area of specialty is information graphics. Um, so I'm gonna be focusing on that genre of imagery. Let's see. So I'm gonna start with some definitions and background information, um, then touch upon how graphics fit into the practice of science communication. Um, then I'll pass along my top tips for designing science graphics. And um, that should take about 30 minutes, like I mentioned. Um, and then I figured we could open things up and have a conversation. So if you wanna revisit some of the ideas I'll be sharing today um, or take a deeper dive, I'm happy to report that my book, Building Science Graphics is now available. It was published in December. Um, so yay, <laughs> yeah, that's very exciting. <laughs> So if you check out the table of contents at this site, um, you'll see chapters that are centered around some of the themes that we'll be talking about today. Um, but and in it, it also has some design fundamentals and step-by-step -step guides for building your own science graphics. Can you hear me okay and everything? Does that sound sound as good? All right. Yeah, can you sound good and the picture looks good. Thank you. Great, cool. Okay, so what are science graphics? Um, let's start with graphics which I generally use as shorthand for information graphics. So by my definition, information graphics are illustrations built on a foundation of research that exist primarily to convey information. For example, here's an information graphic from the pages of Scientific American. Mariette, you might recognize this. <laughs> yeah. The team I at, <laughs> I'm sorry? I sure do. I remember that one. Go ahead. Excellent. Yes. So the team at Brian Christie Design use visual symbols and thoughtful composition to convey very specific information that is rooted in research. So in this case, the goal is twofold. One, show that a variety of different known microbe types reside in a variety of very specific parts of the human body. And two, show how one of the more thoroughly understood microbes interacts with the body. So for the title pages of that same article, they developed an image that's not a literal representation of the concept, but instead it nods to the idea of a human as being defined by the microbes within. So here they're telling a story with visual symbols and thoughtful composition, but it's not an information graphic. Instead, it's an editorial illustration. So it's a metaphorical image that represents the theme of the text with the primary purpose of engaging the reader and priming them for the content that follows. So I tend to think of information graphics as a continuum with figurative representations at one end and abstract on the other. So in the world of science, you could argue that that full continuum can also be referred to as data visualizations. So after all, like essentially all of the work is rooted in data collection at some stage of the process from bone length measurements in dinosaur reconstructions to meticulously documented laboratory experiments that build up a more kind of complete understanding of things like photosynthesis, to representations of mathematical expressions like Feynman diagrams, to straight up plotting of the raw data itself in chart form. But it's probably more useful in most cases to think of the continuum like this, with representative illustrations at one end, data visualizations on the other, and illustrated explanatory diagrams in the middle. 
Today, I'll mostly be focusing on this portion of the continuum, illustrated explanatory diagrams and data visualizations. Okay, so how do science graphics fit into the practice of science communication? Well, as you all know, science communication encompasses a wide range of traditions and frameworks that vary across discipline, time, and space. Um, at its broadest level, um, I like to think of it as generally referring to the idea of sharing information or building knowledge with others that is rooted in the practice or findings of science. At a more granular level, it becomes complicated by like who is or who should be participants in specific exchanges, the roles of those participants, and the goals of those exchanges. So it's tempting to proclaim that visual languages are more universal than spoken and written ones, um, and the very act of presenting information in the form of a drawing instead of words makes it more accessible. Um, but that's not necessarily the case. Visual jargon, for example, is just as prevalent as written jargon. Symbols that carry highly specific information within a specific context can be a really efficient way to communicate with others that are fluent in that visual language, like a peer group of scientists, but they simultaneously act as a brick wall to outsiders. So that said, there's generally a low initial barrier to entry when faced with an image. Color, form, and composition can trigger a reaction from a viewer without significant conscious effort. Um, as perception researcher Colin Ware wrote, quote, visual media can support the perception of almost instantaneous scene gist, rapid explorations of spatial structure and relationships between objects, as well as emotions and motivations, end quote. So that ability to kind of communicate quickly before asking too much of the audience is a powerful thing when you're vying for eyeballs, um, especially if you subscribe to the idea that people's attention is a limited resource. Um, so in science communication, a wide range of image types serve the purpose of engagement. Photographs, editorial illustrations, fine art, and graphics all have the potential to quickly capture the attention of people in different ways. But to my mind, science graphics are kind of uniquely positioned as visual aids that have the power to both beckon people in and to provide concrete information to influence the conversations that follow. At its best, engagement is followed by learning, which then leads to continued engagement, kind of all within the same frame. Okay, so let's move on to my top tips for designing science graphics. Tip number one, be strategic. So building a graphic can be time and cost intensive. So be realistic when it comes to budget, deadlines, and scope. Um, before diving into a project, ask this guiding question. Would a graphic be useful in helping to convey the information at hand? But when is a graphic useful? Well, to my mind, a graphic can be useful if an image can tell the story more efficiently, effectively, or completely than words, like the Feynman diagram we nodded to earlier. Or if the narrative involves complex and intertwining relationships, and an image map can help the reader track connections like a process diagram that explains something like photosynthesis. Or if the reader might benefit from seeing and exploring trends and patterns of the complete data set, rather than being served up a few key numbers in the text. Or when a direct and immediate visual comparison is useful in highlighting change or differences between states, such as competing hypotheses or before and after views. So I'm not a fan of deciding to build a graphic because there's room or money to spare and folks like the idea of filling it with a snazzy visual to engage people. So, I mean, but don't get me wrong because engagement is definitely an honorable goal. But if that's your only goal, I encourage you to consider if a representative illustration, like a straight up drawing of the object or an editorial illustration, like that metaphorical piece of art that's more evocative in nature, or a photograph might be a more fitting solution. So tip two is to articulate the goal of your graphic. So write down the goal of your graphic before you start drawing. What's the point of the image? 
and to be clear too, this is for graphics that are aimed to um, communicate something. Sometimes data visualization, for example, is also used as a tool for analysis, but I'm talking about um, images that are used for communication. So you should keep that goal statement short and succinct, um, ideally one to three sentences. So that stated goal is your touchstone. You keep coming back to it to make sure that the graphic doesn't kind of spiral out of scope. Um, it's also a handy statement to have when communicating with collaborators about the project. So it can help ensure that your intentions are aligned and it can help keep critiques focused on the intended point of the graphic. So here are a few goal statements that I've used to guide graphics in the past. Um, this was one, um, separate out the entwined concepts of dark energy, the cosmological constant and vacuum energy, illustrating each and showing how they're connected. This is the graphic that emerged from that goal statement, um, ultimately designed by Federica Fragapane. Here's a closer look at a few details. So here's another goal statement. So introduce people to the idea of percolation theory. A simple mesh network example demonstrates that in order for any two phones to communicate, they need to be linked by a chain of other phones. And this is the illustration that emerged from that goal statement. So this one doesn't have a discrete and independent caption. Um, it was positioned immediately following the article text that described the concept. Okay, and here's one more. So this goal statement was show how an artificial leaf made of silicon nan nanowires works. In a process similar to photosynthesis in natural leaves, it transforms photons into storable, transportable fuel. Here you can see that artist Sherry Sinan honored the goal statement by showing not only how an artificial leaf works, but also how this particular technology compared to natural photosynthesis. Okay, so for tip three, keep your context in mind. So content is usually pretty clear. It's the information to be visualized as articulated in your goal statement. But context is really important too. And it's often kind of too, it's often neglected at the start of a project. So what tools will be made, will be used to make that graphic? Um, where will it appear? And who is your audience? And what is your relationship to that audience? And when does it need to be completed? All of those factors shape decisions related to what pieces of the content are critical to include and how it should be presented. So some of those factors are more regimented than others. Um, for example, the destination for your graphic might dictate the size and the format. Um, like a journal might provide you with very clear dimension and file type instructions. Um, other variables like the intended audience and accessibility measures those are more complex and less prescriptive. Um, so I recommend starting by just consciously describing and maybe even writing down key variables about the context, including where will your image live? The answer to this question will inform decisions related to both content and style, as well as the dimensions of your graphic and therefore the composition. Um, it also informs the level of detail that might be appropriate. So for example, um, here's the Swiss cheese respiratory virus pandemic defense graphic by Ian McKay. Um, a lot of different folks um, from different media outlets borrowed from this in part because he provided it quite kindly as a CC by 4.0 image. So this version, his original, actually it's his like version 14, I think, because this evolved over time. Um, but this is completely suitable for viewing on a laptop screen or a computer monitor and in print. I'm guessing you might be having a hard time kind of seeing and digesting the details as I talk over it. And while it's on a screen, that might be a little smaller than your full laptop skies. So the title, the subhead, and the labels are critical for a standalone graphic. But combined, those details make this graphic too dense with information for you to properly read while also listening to me talk over it, or if, if you're reading um, closed captions. So for a live presentation, maybe many of those kind of illegible details can be removed. The speaker will be providing the broader context with their voice or with closed captioning. So the graphic doesn't need to be completely self-explanatory. 
The best solution depends on the points that the speaker would like to highlight, but perhaps even something as stripped down as this would make sense. So true, some slide decks do need to operate on a few levels um, since they're often circulated as a proxy for the live presentation. Um, but in those cases, leaving all of the text in place might make sense as not everyone will have the benefit of a speaker walking them through the content. But if you're optimizing your content for a live audience, reducing density is a good idea. If you like the best of both worlds, um, you can keep the slide less dense and include a link to the original fully detailed graphic in your um, presentation notes. So if it's important to highlight all of the visible details in the original graphic, consider a series of static slides that help you guide your re reader, either kind of your audience's attention through the graphic and labels in a really focused and intentional way, kind of like this. So you might be thinking that's not a very big change, and you're right, it didn't take that long to execute. But that was an editable file, and I'm pretty familiar with using vector programs, so I could edit it easily. But what if your original graphic is a flattened bitmap file, and the objects can't be moved, edited, or deleted independently, or you're not quite confident in your skills to really kind of thin it out um, on the live file? So for the case of slides or social media posts, you could consider simply kind of using a little bit more kind of uh, rudimentary um, tools to crop in or highlight details of your original graphic. So in this case, I recommend reducing the contrast of the portions that are outside of the area of interest. So that helps focus attention and reduces visual noise, just like a spotlight. So then as you talk folks through the concept, you can direct their attention to the relevant details, the pieces that you're talking about. So it's really important to think about where and how your imagery will be presented, and then think through solutions that will help optimize your image for that specific setting. Okay, so some other questions you should ask yourself are, who is the target audience and what is your publication's relationship with that audience? For example, um, for an article on quantum mechanics and bird navigation, the scientist authors provided us with a super reference diagram. So the key information is all represented here, but it's not very clear unless you already know a little bit about the topic. Um, it's optimized for their peers and expert audience. Ultimately, the story team translated some of the jargon and provided more context for a non-specialist audience with the captions. So critically, bird drawings by Jillian Dittner helped connect the abstract processes to the big picture for a non-specialist audience. Okay, so given the audience and outlet, what tone or vibe feels appropriate? So the answer to this question, along with the subject matter, will inform decisions related to rendering style and illustrative details. That's demonstrated here by a pair of graphics that both show an exoplanet passing in front of a star. So the coloring book page on the left for kids excludes some technical details and jargon, and it's rendered in a more playful style than the graphic on the same topic for the adults on the right. And this wonderfully quirky graphic by Mona Shalabi for The Guardian is really well suited to engage general readers with a topic, but it probably isn't a great match for an academic journal. So after putting some thought into your context, which can also be thought of as the final outlet and target audience, revisit your goal statement to make sure that the content you hope to convey still feels suitable. Moving on to tip four, remember that building a graphic is a process. You can't expect graphics to emerge fully formed right before they're due in a single go. Um, so with some forethought and structure, you can set up your graphics building process to dovetail the stages of your larger project um, so that the graphics can be properly reviewed by others in context. So I recommend starting out with a lot of fast, low risk doodles, experimenting with different ways to organize the information. Um, there's something kind of freeing about just taking a pencil to paper and scribbling out ideas. And this works for data visualization too. Pencil sketches are fast, foster an exploratory mentality, and they're low risk. Then once you've narrowed in on a solution that you're feeling good about, you can shift from exploration mode into presentation mode and make things more intelligible for your collaborators. 
So at this point, I find it helpful to break the process up into three formal segments, the concept sketch, a tight sketch, and a final graphic. So again, if you dovetail those steps with other deadlines for your project, like text revision and editing deadlines, it kind of helps keep you on track and making sure that everything is aligned. For your concept sketch, um, create a frame that matches the absolute dimensions of your final product. Um, you can use your doodles as a guide and then transcribe that information into the larger frame. Include preliminary captions or at least placeholder text and labels so that you remember to actively design them into the space and you're considering how they'll relate to the imagery from the start. And then send that concept sketch out for review by your collaborators with specific questions related to what type of feedback you're hoping for at each stage. For example, um, at this concept sketch stage, I'm most interested in making sure that I'm getting the big picture right and that folks understand the intended flow of information. I'm not focusing on aesthetics at this stage. You kind of have to check your ego at the door a little. <laughs> but feedback should focus on whether or not the information and the path through that information is useful, clear, and accurate. And then if the feedback from collaborators on that concept sketch is relatively minor and it kind of pertains to details within the larger plan, it's time to develop a tight sketch. So here you kind of correct the errors and sharpen the details. If you're responsible for writing the captions, you can refine them now too. And if somebody else is writing them, this is a good time to kind of make sure that your intentions are aligned. Um, pay special attention to the text and label position and the developing render, rendering style at this point. Uh, so for the final graphic, you correct any remaining errors or anything that was introduced that was an error um, and finalize the rendering style, including color. For this one, um, artist Sherry Sinan um, took it to final for me. It's always a treat when you um, collaborate with an artist that you know can do a better job at the final piece than you can. <laughs> so it's kind of like opening a gift uh, and watching that unfold. So by working through these stages with concept sketches that start at, as kind of broad stroke composition guides that are deeply rooted in the concept being explained, I find that I'm forced to really kind of think through the content before I get distracted by drawing details. It's not unusual to kind of revisit that concept sketch a few times before you get the content right. Big picture change requests can, may undermine kind of that composition, so the original plan that you've already developed, but resist the temptation just to paste, like copy and paste corrections into your existing plan. Kind of need to think to make sure that the way we're kind of guiding readers through that material still is the best way to guide them through the information. So yeah, it, it is a, it's a pain to backtrack um, and rethink your goal and the composition of your graphic based on new information but it's best to sort that out before you move on to a tight sketch. So taking the time to kind of thoughtfully address feedback at the concept sketch stage sets things up for a smoother progression through the remaining steps. Okay, so tip five is clarify, don't simplify. So more often than not, scientific content is complex and the research papers that describe it can be dense. Um, so if you try to strip away that complexity for a general audience, you're at risk of producing either something that's kind of an oversimplified primer graphic that doesn't really present the latest findings, or a graphic that shows the latest discovery without proper context for folks new to the topic. So I find it more productive to focus on clarifying, not simplifying. Um, and that's not a unique framing. I stole that from Nigel Holmes, who's an amazing designer who goes way back with Time Magazine. Um, and more recently, Alberto Cairo has um, written more about that topic with a hat tip to Nigel as well. So with an eye to clarity, you become a translator or a guide. The focus shifts away from watering the information down and turns towards knocking down barriers of entry and beckoning the reader in. The goal is to make complex and specialized information accessible to your audience. So that's particularly critical when developing a graphic for a broad audience. But I found it to be also a really helpful mindset when creating graphics for content area experts, um, as it prevents you from falling back on too many assumptions with regards to your shared language. 
here are a few strategies for doing it. Starting with embracing complexity. For a Scientific American article on gene expression in the brain by scientists Ed Lean and Michael Harwellett, I started with charts provided by the authors that were similar to this one. These charts portray how gene expression varies between individuals. So color indicates the extent of the variability. It's a chart or map style that allows for a cross comparison of brain structures within a chart and between different scenarios across more than one chart. So you'd have several of these next to each other. So the original charts were designed to communicate results within a peer group, an audience of other neuroscientists highly motivated to read and understand the images. They lean on a visual vocabulary of symbols and colors that would be familiar to other neuroscientists. I like to think of it as using visual jargon, which I mentioned a few times here. So jargon, again, it can be really useful. Words and imagery that carry highly specific meaning within a specific context is a really efficient way to present complex information to others within a community. But jargon in both written and drawn forms can act as a brick wall to people who are not fluent in that language. And so there are very few, if any, points of entry here for the uninitiated. Sometimes the content you're trying to communicate is complicated like this, and that's okay. Again, the goal isn't to water it down or to oversimplify. The goal is to clarify. So for the gene expression graphic makeover, um, I ultimately collaborated with data designer Yan Willem Tulp to develop something more broadly accessible. So in this case, that didn't mean a different chart form. Instead, we stripped away the barriers of entry and added some welcoming gestures. So we started with the source material, then slowly walked through it, translating one detail at a time into a more broadly understood written and visual language, adding in layers of context for folks new to the topic. So the full data set remained intact. Ian Willem simply removed insider conventions, such as the rainbow color palette. Um, he replaced it with a more intuitive and aesthetically pleasing tonal scale. We included a few brain illustrations to make abstract brain region terms tangible and relatable. So this one's a mouse brain, not very well known to most, uh, most readers, but the facing page had a human brain, which kind of helped uh, let people know what they were looking at more immediately. We explained how to read the graphic in plain language with help of the text editor, um, Wade Gibbs, and then used a leader line pointing directly to the reference spot in the chart then energized the layout by turning the charts 45 degrees and cropping off some of the redundant portions of each plot. Okay, strategies two. This one's a little bit easier. You annotate the primary source material directly in plain language. So press releases and academic publications often include images that reference the key finding. Um, very often, those images are not optimized for folks new to the topic, not always, but often. For example, take this image from back in 2012 um, when direct evidence of the Higgs boson was announced. Many news outlets ran the pickup images as is, but how many of their readers really understood what they were seeing? And I mean, that said, I'm not trying to imply that the folks that generated this imagery did anything wrong. It's all about the ultimate audience and the goal of the graphic. These are base images that were released for broad use. So when I pick up this sort of imagery to present to readers as Scientific American, I need to think about how the image will be encountered in the context of the full article. Other media outlets might be using the imagery in other ways, like a teaser image in so social media posts. So with just a little additional work, these kinds of images can be annotated with key points to be clarify what's being depicted. So a few labels can go a long way in helping readers make sense of what they're looking at. Here are the bottom images from the source with the addition of two photon labels that I've added. At the top, we included a schematic of what the scientists were looking for. So now the reader has a little more context. Those green bars in the source material are evidence of particles that were emitted from the Higgs boson inside of some sort of contraption. Here's a closer look at that pair of images. So the hypothesis is on the left and the observation is on the right. 
So think about how labels or annotations might be able to help a reader focus on the critical takeaways. If you don't immediately understand the graphic, even if it's beautiful and kind of eye grabbing, your audience probably won't either. Um, so labels and annotations can kind of help walk them through and point out the important bits. So um, figures in scientific papers also generally rely on visual jargon a lot. So if you're a scientist working up a graphic about your work, or if you're starting with an academic paper as your source material, pause and think about your audience you might need to decode some of the visual elements that have been used as shorthand. At the very least, I recommend making sure that you define the specialized symbols that you use, as shown here, for example. So arrowheads and bars are often used in biology to represent activation and inhibition. Um, it's a useful shorthand for others who are fluent in that language, but I don't recommend leaning back on them for broader audiences. Um, the addition of a simple label or annotation can help clarify the meaning. Okay, strategy three is to fold background information into the main graphic. Um, you may have heard of Voyagin's star, also known as Tabby's star, after the astronomer Tabitha Voyagin, who first noticed kind of odd fluctuations in the apparent brightness when viewed from Earth. Um, if you don't know it by name, you might recall it from headlines that suggested that the dimming could be the result of alien superstructures in orbit around the star. Probably not true. Uh, here's a plot of light from that star with an overall downward trend punctuated by vertical drop-offs. So for an article on the topic, we decided to create a data visualization to tell one piece of the story. Why is the dimming pattern perplexing? So presenting a graph of the perceived light intensity from Tappy's star based on this was a start, but it would only demonstrate the pattern and not explain why it was unusual. So to do that, we needed to represent a more common star dimming situation, a pattern of regular dips caused by a planet passing in front of the star in a fixed orbit. So armed with that information, the reader can then see why the irregular pattern exhibited by Tabby's star is so odd. Here's the common pattern, and then here's the unusual pattern exhibited by Tabby's star. We also included labels to help direct attention to the critical parts, an interval of steady dimming, and then the highly variable dip pattern. And then here's the full box showing those two views side by side. Again, by showing a more common star dimming situation on the left, the, the reader kind of has a better appreciation for why the irregular pattern on the right is notable. Okay, so strategy four is to include a separate primer box. If you're torn between the need to provide background material and the desire to get right to it with information on the latest discovery, consider breaking things down into two independent graphics. A primer box can introduce basic concepts to readers who might need more context. So readers more familiar with the topic can then jump straight to the new stuff. We did that with this definition box for an article on uncertainty by Jessica Holman. So confidence intervals were nodded to a few times in the text. This textbook-like box allowed us to break the concept down in a glossary-like way, and then use that concept in other charts later in the article. And for an article on pig flu, we presented a basic primer box on how a virus replication works. Then we can move on to the specific information related to this particular strain of flu. That large primer box provided background information for folks new to the topic or for folks who could use a refresher. So that's all of my formal remarks for today. Um, and then so I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and maybe we can have some questions and a conversation. So let's see, let me end the show. Get back to Zoom. Thanks, Jen. Yay. Oops, my second monitor is over here, so I'm going to have to look over. There we go. Cool. Yay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Some applause up there. In the chat, there's a few. Tyler, I'll let you, you, mm -hmm. you do them, but I see there's a few things in the chat. Yeah. So, um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, uh, we have a question in the chat um, about collaborations and how do you convey to clients and collaborators that concept and type sketches are just the beginning pieces to go off of. Um, the commenter also mentions that, uh, especially for some academic clients, um, there's difficulty 
uh, in critiquing a, uh, a <laughs> concept sketch um, for what it is and for what stage it's in. Yeah, no, great question. Um, I usually try to feel out with each uh, collaborator because some um, some have clearly done this lots before and they're more uh, used to uh, providing feedback on things like sketches. Um, but I have gotten comments back on like pencil sketches where a scientist has said, this is going to be in color, right? It's like, this is so obviously a pencil sketch, but I'm like, no, they just they don't necessarily understand where this falls in the in that broader um, arc. So um, I often kind of have a, a few, like a paragraph that I just kind of copy and paste, so a few sentences that sort of explains that, you know, you're going to see three stages, ideally. This concept sketch is, you know, don't worry, this isn't the final style. I might even be hiring a different artist to complete it. But right now, I'm just trying to make sure that I have the information um, accurate. Like, am I understanding things correctly? And is the flow of the way I'm telling this story make sense? Usually, I ask content experts, is this accurate? And I ask my colleagues, is the flow here make sense? Because a content expert might be like, yeah, it totally makes sense because they're used to like kind of thinking through that process. So the questions might vary a little bit depending on which collaborator you're running it by. Um, but I do try to just be really clear, like this is a really rough, sometimes I'll even say, this is a really rough concept sketch. Here are my questions. Um, I might have some specific questions, but I also just want to make sure that they're looking at it for accuracy overall. I also sometimes mark up my sketch directly. So if they're looking at it after maybe just skimming an email, not really reading every word incredibly carefully, they'll also see very rough concept sketch written in like big all caps on it. And, um, and I might circle things and ask specific questions if I wanna direct their attention to a particular piece. Thank you. Um, we also have another question in the chat on um, how do you learn the details that are necessary to communicate some complex aspects of like how the science is done? Yeah, it really varies from project to project, especially like I, I really like working with scientist authors because I kind of have a direct line to an expert. So, um, but I also work with journalist authors, which is, which is fabulous because we're sometimes looking at a broader you know, a bigger, a bigger kind of take on the on the scene. So we're pulling together more disparate pieces into something um, that kind of uh, describes the the state of a particular field, as opposed to what's coming out of one particular lab. Um, I generally start with just doing some really basic, like I'll, I'll spend a couple hours doing my own research using Google and Google image search, just to kind of make sure um, I'm understanding some of the terms. I have a basic sense of where this might fit into other um, stories about the same topic. I might have a general sense of what have other like news outlets, if I'm doing a Scientific American article, what have other news outlets done on this already? So like what holes are here that we can maybe swoop in and kind of help fill that information gap. So I do spend a couple of hours um, uh, doing Google searches and reading papers, like I try to get the primary papers that are connected to this particular discovery. Um, but then uh, it's just asking really like asking questions. Um, I didn't used to do a lot of talking directly with scientists in a face-to-face -face meeting um, or on the phone, um, just because I found it easier to mark up things and send by email. But during the pandemic, I found myself hopping on a call with a with a, a reporter or an editor and the scientists more and more often. And I'm finding that pretty useful um, to kind of, you know, say, send a sketch ahead of time. And then on that call, while the reporter is asking their questions to kind of get a sense of how they're going to write the captions or the text around this, um, I, I can also then ask really specific questions about the graphic that they have already um, seen maybe a 24 hours beforehand, and then we can talk about details from there. Um, but I definitely do try to do my homework first, so I'm not... Um, uh, not using up more of the content experts time than mm -hmm. um, than ideal yeah yeah that makes sense um uh on the same note of like speaking with uh, content experts and like the team making the uh, visual visualization goodness gracious um <laughs> are there um 
kind of specific avenues that people or especially specifically our community members could like go through to um, enter kind of a career in data visualization or scientific graphics? Yeah, for sure. So folks who are interested in data visualization, um, this is a really good time for that because the Data Visualization Society mm -hmm. has really like they've kind of pulled together like, you know, over the last decade or so, it's been a field probably more than a decade now. It's been a field that's grown quite a bit and it's now um, kind of coalesced into a community of people who are really generous. Um, so there's the Data Visualization Society and um, they have a really active Slack um, you know, Slack situation happening. It can be a little overwhelming sometimes, but there's a great space to ask questions there. Um, uh, so that's like kind of my first stop for folks who are thinking about like more actively stepping into the data visualization world. Um, for uh, kind of information design and science graphics, it's a little, there's a few other different avenues to kind of take there. Um, so for folks who are really interested in um, kind of the, the craft of scientific illustration, there's the Guild of Natural Science Illustrators. Um, uh, that's rooted a little bit more in the tradition of like botanical illustration and specimen drawings, but the community is um, broader than that for sure. Um, there's a information design is kind of an interesting uh, area within that. And then you also get perception researchers who are studying how it is that we all perceive designed pieces. So um, information plus, so it's just the word information with a, the symbol plus um, is a conference that's been happening every other year that I really enjoy because it brings together researchers who are studying uh, kind of the cognitive science of, of um, graphics and um, designers who are creating graphics. Um, so it's kind of a fun combination of scientists and designers and everywhere in between. That's really cool. I think I've seen um, the Data Visualization Society on Twitter. Um, the other ones I have not. Um, I've put the links to some of those in the chat, everyone. I'll also post them on our Slack. Um, Excellent. Yeah, I okay. see, I, I've noticed, uh, I noticed, I'm, you mentioned that you hired freelancers for some of the Scientific American visualizations. Do you typically look kind of within the Data Visualization Society for those freelancers? Uh, yeah, sorry, I'm just putting the name of the conference in there. Okay, yes. So how I find data visualizers and other folks. Um, uh, I often, honestly, Twitter is a really great way. I mean, um, the international data viz community really coalesced around Twitter. That's shifting now. Um, so I think, I think uh, I'll be, yeah, I think that'll be less of a great source for me moving forward. Um, the Data Viz Society, uh, is a little less easy for me to like uh, find artists within because it's a lot of people asking questions of each other. So it's a bit, a bit more of a kind of a supportive network, um, a little less of a being able to see a lot of portfolios. Mm -hmm. um, but just kind of staying on top of, of that in the conferences and just uh, keeping my eye out on other publications. Whenever I see a graphic that I like for any reason, I'm like, what's the artist's name? What's the credit? Who to the data viz designer here? So I'm constantly just uh, looking for um, credits connected to imagery that I think is really successful and then just create a spreadsheet. Um, the trick, par tricky part is, is, you know, I might find a, somebody who specializes in like astronomical data viz and I'm like, excellent, I want to work with them. And then I kind of have to wait till the right project comes along. So sometimes there's a little bit of a, t a time lag there, um, but I'm, I'm always just keeping my eyes open. Um, other publications, Twitter, now Mastodon, um, try to go to conferences, um, but mostly it's looking at other publications too, yeah. quite honestly. Um, for those who are interested in getting into um, data visualization um, and want to like make a graphic, um, how do you suggest them sort of starting to get into making graphics and building up their own portfolio? Sure, so for data visualization, um, one of the things, you know, the, the Data Viz Society has things like prompts to get people to kind of, uh, and, and a group of people that sort of will critique each other's work to help folks build portfolios. Um, there's a lot of great 
more specific tools and communities around those. Um, Tableau, I think, is a little bit more in the business world, um, probably less so in the science world. Um, but there's communities of folks who use R and D3 in different coding languages, and they sort of really kind of um, kind of coalesce together. Uh, and, and you can kind of start to find those if you're just looking on Twitter and search for, for some of those terms or on um, uh, the of Society and whatnot. Um, there's some tools that I love using that kind of, because I don't code data viz. Um, I hire a lot of artists that do, or a lot of designers that do, but my um, coding is, is a limited skill set. So there's tools like, um, I'm going to put a link in here that, uh, let's see, raw graphics is a pretty amazing tool. Um, raw, raw graphs. I just want to make sure I get the website right. There we are. Um, it's a tool that if you're comfortable with something like Excel and you want to be able to like immediately start to do some some graphics that you see out in the in the world that look better than what you're doing with Excel, um, it's a kind of an amazing tool that uh, helps bridge the gap between you being able to code things from the ground up um, and being really comfortable in something like Excel. Um, as far as like illustrated graphics, um, I think it's just a lot of practice too. Just like, you know, uh, practice asking people for critiques. I think a lot of folks who come at science communication and visuals from the science end of things instead of the art world end of things aren't necessarily really used to and comfortable with critiques, um, but, uh, but kind of learning how to have those conversations and to find out like if somebody says, I don't really like this, it's like, like, well, why are you getting hung up on a part here? You know, what, you know, so, so trying to hone in on um, why isn't this graphic successful for this particular person who's looking at it and trying to figure out and hone in on how can changes in maybe the color palettes or the position of objects on the page um, or, you know, how, how can changes there kind of address the needs of the critique that's happening? Yeah. Um, we have a couple of minutes. If anyone is comfortable asking their question aloud, please feel free to do so. I will keep talking. We all know this, but I'm just trying to give some options. Sure, I can go ahead and ask mine. <laughs> um, so I'm coming from a background where I was classically trained in art, and then I came into science, and I only realized a couple of years ago that I could actually combine the two. And so I've been doing a lot of freelancing, things like that, but I'm kind of moving I would like to move into a more formal position. Could you talk about things other than consulting and freelancing that we could do that's kind of in this creative visual psychom sector? Ah, good question. I wish I had a, a, an answer ready to roll for that one. <laughs> um, I think it's just, well, freelancing, you know, just kind of putting feelers out and trying to get some work so you're practicing and doing that. Um, there's a lot of um, kind of, communities like the sci art which also are kind of different ways in on this topic um i'm gonna put another link in the chat so um as folks are trying to figure out how to communicate things like climate change and how to you know how to, to deal with pandemics realizing the shortcomings of some of the ways we thought would work like well you just tell people the facts and everything will be fine right it's like no that's not always what this doesn't always work so um so like uh, fine art and ways kind of to get into um getting people to talk about topics in science in a way that's not like here are all the facts but it's sort of a a, a conversation starter like the warming stripes you I imagine many of you have seen these the red and um, blue stripes by ed hawkins um uh, they've been on like uh you know magazine covers but also like uh screens at concerts and uh whether people are wearing them on ties and dresses and so graphics that kind of become the conversation starters and get people talking about um about topics in science that's one um kind of another way to get into it um sorry i'm talking around this a little bit i'm trying to find uh no i don't i don't want to pass along the wrong link so um well i also don't want to have you Ah, here it is, Sci Art Initiative. Okay, I'm gonna put it in the link. So there's um, different ways to kind of come at this. Um, 
did that work? Oh, great. Thanks for putting the show your stripes in there. So the Sci Art Initiative is kind of another community that's using the arts as a way to get people to talk about science. Um, yeah, I don't know. Did I, I hope I, I don't know if I very clearly answered your questions. Do you have any follow ups to that that I could be more useful with? No, I think it does, because I've noticed in terms of, you know, job titles, it's so diverse across different companies and sectors. Um, but just having some initiatives, because I've already done a fair amount of freelancing, and mm -hmm. that's great, but I definitely want to do something a little bit more formal um, and less unpredictable, I guess yeah. is a word for it. So uh, that's even having some places to go and just get started. That's great. Thank you. Yeah. No, I recommend seeing like if there are publications or organizations that continuously put out work that uh, that you're excited about, check out their mastheads, look at their organizational charts. A lot of those might have um, uh, communication uh, departments who actually have full-time um, designers or uh, graphics folks or people. I'm, I've noticed a lot that try to have people who could write and do graphics together. Yeah. So if you see a publication or um, an organization that seems to really um, value that, um, just look at organizational charts to try to figure out who to contact. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you. Yes, I can also ask my question out loud. Um, I like had a good number of questions in the chat because like, I, I guess like for some context, I am a second year PhD student who um, did their undergrad like in the science field has been doing art like kind of like along the side for a while now but um I like one of the issues that I've run into um is that I feel like a lot of scientists are very disrespectful in terms of like I think like the figure making process and also kind of like making assumptions about like oh if you're an artist you might you must not be as good of a scientist as people who spend all their time doing their science and so I'm kind of curious as to like how like whether you've encountered those kinds of interactions before and how you've managed to kind of deal with them yeah no i've i've, I've had both ends of the scale people who are just like so amazing and almost uh, not critical enough that you're like no i know this isn't right tell me how to make it right and folks who are basically want to tell me how to do it um you know, sometimes I just kind of evaluate like, wait, you know, I, I'm working with a lot of these scientists just um, for maybe one story. So um, and just trying to figure out, OK, does my text editing colleague have a better working relationship with this particular person than I do? Maybe, um, uh, you know, we can you know, work, you know, kind of together uh, to kind of get where we need to go. Like how much time do we have? Do we, you know, how educational of an experience do we want to make this for the scientists and like the realities of just needing to get it done too. Um, uh, but generally I find that if I am just really clear about the process and like there is a process and that like, you know, I, I we're thinking through all these things, you know, we're professionals at this. So um, uh, just saying, OK, these are the stages and, you know, just kind of outlining a process. Also kind of like, oh, OK, well, here are the parameters and here are the rules. And this is how, you know. So I think uh, folks who are used to very kind of analytical thinking um, kind of respond um, in general uh, to that kind of approach. It's like, OK, this isn't just like I, I don't really care what you think about the color palette. I got that. Like, <laughs> I'm, I'm, you know, but I'm not going to say that, but I'm like, okay, here's what I need from you. Very clear about what I need from you. Is this accurate? Is this, you know, and then I'm not asking about the color, you know, <laughs> like, so uh, there's, I think just focusing that energy onto things that uh, really make the best use of what they're bringing to the table and pulling the energy away from stuff that is like what you are bringing to the table and your collaborators um, is kind of the best way to kind of navigate those trickier situations. Hi, Jen, I have a question. Um, so you mentioned the conference that brings together designers with um, like psychology and cognition researchers. So that got me wondering, like, are there any specific insights on perception or cognition that you tend to try to keep in mind when you're designing graphics or iterating with someone creating a graphic? Yes, and there's a whole chapter on it in my book. So I know that <laughs> I, I shouldn't make you have to go by the book today and answer that question. So um, yeah, there are uh, a lot of kind of principles and things that have been kind of um, emerging from perception science. But as you can imagine, they're very specifically uh, based on like one variable. 
And so, and when you're divide, when you're designing graphics for audience, like wider audiences, like it's really hard to say how any of those can like help guide your whole graphic. But some of the concepts um, definitely help like gestalt principles. Some of them, um, these are ideas like things that are close together are often thought of as being associated. So um, uh, as you're trying to guide somebody's eye through something, um, uh, you can use some of these principles. Um, some have been uh, modified as researchers have studied it more. Um, but there are uh, the IEEE Viz Week is a well. Actually, I'm trying to think of some good. You know what? Actually, let me guide you to. Um, I have a more to explore section on my book that leads to some of my favorite resources on that front. But Multiple Views is a blog post that's written by, um, let's see, I feel like I should I should follow up with y'all later with some links or something because I don't want to be typing instead of talking. Uh, multiple, ah, found it, okay. Um, so this is a great entry point. Um, this is, a blog post written by uh, perception researchers uh, to describe the kind of work that they're doing. Um, there's been a lot of recent stuff on visualizing uncertainty in particular um, that's been really useful in trying to figure out like how to convey this idea of uncertainty around things like hurricane projections, like where they're going and that sort of thing. Um, but I think if you start at this multiple views visualization explained bit, and then I'm gonna just put one more resource in here. And then here, scroll down to, I think I have perception science. Yeah, it's chapter five. So there's, um, a couple of books and more resources there. 39 Studies About Human Perception in 30 Minutes is a talk by Kennedy Elliott that's at that link um, uh, that I found really useful too. So um, there's some stuff for you to dive into. Awesome, thank you. Thank you. We have three more minutes on our mentor chat time. Um, does anyone have one last question? because I will ask it. Okay, Jen, um, have you had, what was your Spark data visualization, if you've got one? Can you explain what you mean by that? So the, the data visualization or science graphic that you saw and you're like, oh, I'm doing that. I've got to uh, do that. <laughs> oh, good question. For me, it was more of a, a slow process. Like I was, I, I studied uh, geology and art as an undergrad and I was like, I'm not ready to decide between these two. How can I put off that decision? So then I found a graduate program in science illustration. And I thought, well, that sounds like a handy way to avoid that decision for at least one more year. So I started that, but then I wasn't really excited about drawing, like doing classic botanical illustrations and whatnot. I wanted to like draw processes and things that you can't photograph and, and, uh, and concepts. Um, and so it just kind of, uh, it unrolled from that. Um, and then I kind of, and that's at a time when data visualization kind of wasn't its own thing. So I kind of um, learned uh, just through evolving from this idea of drawing objects and scenes to drawing concepts and processes and then apprenticeship style learning from there. So I was pretty fortunate in that just kind of trying to not make a decision for as long as possible kind of put me on a path. No, I love that. I feel like procrastination is a, a really great way to figure out what you like. Like, what are you procrastinating on and what are you doing to do that? And just like yeah, and switch, it, just and like, if you're that's not willing, what you should do. <laughs> yeah, and if you're not willing to let something go, it's like, well, why? <laughs> like, can I, can I try to hold on to it longer then? Exactly. And what do I need to do to hold on to it longer? So, thank you. So, like the idea that you can combine, you know, because that was true for me. So, I originally wanted to be a scientist, but I also liked to write, and I was also really interested in how to explain things visually. So <laughs> very nice to work with Jen all these uh, years and I, my career ended up combining them. So, you know. Yeah, it's same for me too. I'm well, I'm here with you guys because I procrastinated in grad school. Yeah. <laughs> doing things. <laughs> Honestly, it gives me hope. Like, if, you know, those of us that have those interests, I feel like sometimes it's so isolating because we're so surrounded by people that are just science, 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 science all the time. 
And so it's really refreshing to see people that get to do this every day. And it gives me some hope because it's just, this is something I get to do on the side right now, but it's like, I just, I want more. So thank you for also bringing hope to, you know, the next generation of people that are going to end up doing this as careers. I appreciate that a lot. Yeah. Yeah. It's exciting to, second, to meet yeah. with folks who, who feel that way. So, yeah. Actually, well, I know we hit 12.30, but I was wondering if I could ask like a brief follow-up question to that, um, or I don't know if it's like a brief, an would have a brief answer, but like, I guess within like the science and like the art like realms, I feel like there's also like, I feel like I get frustrated when people assume that like, because I like to do both that like, I only want to make art about science, but like, I I'm like wondering like how you kind of like balance like any like sort of like desire to like make art that isn't related to science and like what like space you create for that. <laughs> yeah, so I'm I'm more than happy to stick around, but I understand if some other folks need to hop off, so I will not be offended if <laughs> people drop. But um, uh, you know, it's interesting. I uh, you probably don't want to hear this answer, but I honestly don't do a lot of art for myself anymore. But the re the way I loved art wasn't because I felt like I had paintings I need to get out of me or like I was I was a kid who needed people to tell me what to draw I'd be like I want to draw what should I draw and I, somebody would need to say oh you should try drawing x y or z and so then I like so I liked the problem solving part of after having this thing I needed to draw to then draw it so I kind of come at the art thing from a slightly different angle and that um I never really was uh, I, I, yeah, I, I kind of always wanted something to specific to to illustrate. I was more of an illustrator than a fine artist. I, I guess it might be a way of putting it. Um, so I wasn't kind of cleaving off this this other part of me in, in when I was uh, you know and and then um, I just kind of became all consumed with science graphics and then things like writing about them and that kind of thing. So that kind of you know I, so I don't do a lot of my own art now. I do know a lot of people that do though. So, um, so don't take my, uh, my experience there as a, as a bad sign. Well, There's Jen, some really neat, um, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, I just wanted to thank you so much for, for joining everybody today. That was very awesome. If, if folks have other questions, could, could, uh, could they ask you them separately? Cause I, I sense that some may have follow-up questions. Absolutely. In fact, um, please do. Uh, I'm going to put my um, I'm going to put my personal email address in here instead of my work one. Um, uh, so that's now in the chat. Um, just let me know that you met me here too, just so I can have some context for what we've already discussed. But don't hesitate, especially if there were some resources that I wasn't able to kind of spit back out at you fast enough for um, for specific places to look. I do have a lot of URLs and organizations and things that I can um, uh, pass along. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jen. I think we will we will end now, guys. Um, <laughs> Um, I just want to thank you all for attending this month's mentor chat. Um, and I hope that this mentor chat gave you all a sense for, you know, a different avenue of science communication and storytelling. Um, also, our spring mentor chat schedule um, is out. Um, so for February, we'll be joined by civic science fellow Jailana Sheets for a conversation on how you can effectively communicate with audiences outside of your comfort zone, because that is something we still need to do and work on. Um, and March, uh, we will have a conversation about science consulting with Star Trek physics consultant Aaron McDonald, um, so we can get some wheels turning about how science communication skills can be applied uh, to the big screen and the small screen. So make sure you guys register for those. The emails in your inbox, you will get another one in a couple of weeks. So I'm not marked as spam. 